All right, thanks everybody for joining. I guess we'll go get started. Uh, I'm Jeff Borneman, and I'm from Red Hat. We work on, this is Michael Serby. We both work on OpenShift, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the exciting features we see in, in staple sets and how they apply to, to Mongo. So a little bit about the agenda today is so we're gonna go ahead and define what staple sets are, then go ahead and give you some examples of use cases for staple sets, and then after that, take some time and do some live demoing, so. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the things I, I really, I like that have come out in the, the latest version of Kubernetes, so I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, just a little bit of ground rules. I mean, we, uh, we're a little informal here, so there will be some questions at the end, but if anybody has anything pressing, please raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, if this devolves into some sort of discussion, that's all right with us. Hopefully that's all right with you. Um, otherwise, this is the last session of the day, so I think everybody's loosey-goosey and been learning a lot and ready to get home, so. All right, let's get into it. So what are stable sets? Stable sets are a way for you to bring stable applications or workloads to Kubernetes. They were originally brought to Kubernetes uh, in 1.5, and then they're going GA in 1.9, so. Just a few, just a few uh, nice features. Uh, essentially, all around this is centered around uh, pods having greater sense of identity. So how we usually think about pods in terms of deployments is that there are these stateless, uh, there are these stateless workloads. They can be killed when they're not needed, scaled up when they are, and so on and so forth. So thinking about pods in terms of identity, what do we have? Well, now we have stable replica storage. So when stable sets scale up, we can have stable storage that also scales with those replicas. Each, each replica also has its own network identity now. So instead of just being limited to pods being load balanced in a service, we have pods with their own addressable space. And then we have some sense of ordered startup for stable sets. And that tends to mesh really well with the kinds of applications that are most applicable to staple sets. So what kind of problems do they solve? Um, Mike and I both work a lot with Red Hat customers and, and their journey through containers. And one of the things that we see that is most applicable to staple sets are vendor applications. So there is sort of a, a timeline of, or a progression or evolution of of containers, and, and one thing that we see is that vendors do see the, the value in containers, and they do see the, the value in container orchestration, but there's some missing pieces between that and the, the support for the underlying platform that the containers run on. Um, so this is a great way for our customers and, and adopters to lift, what we call lift and shift, their container workloads over to Kubernetes. Uh, we also, you know, some other things, to be a little bit more specific, uh, storage with scale is what I mean by this. Applications that scale, they tend to need their own storage, whether that be in indices or some sort of runtime state information. And then chatty clusters. So clusters, when they scale, they like to talk to one another, gather, gather like graph information, um, and then order cluster entries. So entries into the cluster like to have uh, some notion of the, the replicas before them being ready and started. And, and to add to your points, also everything that comes with Kubernetes, like velocity, so the time to develop a product or a vendor product and get it out the door is uh, additionally something that comes into mind, as well as scalability from not only the software perspective, but also team's perspective, and then um, yeah, just uh, overall efficiency and automation kind of brought into the problem. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so like an example, I'm mean, a concrete example here. Uh, Cassandra, so if you think about Cassandra, Cassandra cluster, we have nodes in a graph, and they use this protocol, a gossip protocol, to share information between the nodes in the graph and um, uh, the, the edges in the graph. So thinking about how do we scale Cassandra in this method, staple sets add some value here. Another example is Confluence Data Center. So this is an interesting example because it actually hits all three points here. Um, we have Confluence in a data center. There's, it's a very uh, traditional sysadmin-y sort of startup procedure. 
Um, every node in the cluster has to be started ready before a new node is added. Um, every node also needs to have its own stable storage. So it's, it uh, stores index information, leucine index information per node. There's also some shared storage for, for a configuration that you'd see exposed through a PVC or the like. And then, of course, they need replication. So they each need some notion of a network address and being able to communicate with one another. And that's really the question is, how do we take these patterns and scale them? Because it's not really an issue of putting them on Kubernetes. We can certainly do that. We could manually create services that expose the, the replicas and all that, but it may be orchestrated through Helm. But you know, Kubernetes, or excuse me, staple sets really add an easy way for this to happen in an automated fashion. So why would you put a cluster within a cluster? Why not? <laughs> well, in all, all honesty, it's the ability to provide a, a migration path for these clustered applications so that they could then take advantage of the framework or embedded features that are already out of the box with inside of Kubernetes and the vibrant community around them. So, you know. in an ideal world, you know, they'd sit just in Kubernetes, and there'd be there'd be this lack of you know cluster inception. But um, you know, there it is. It is a bridge that needs to be gap to need, that needs to a gap that needs to be bridged. Maybe we'll bring the, the mic over to you because there's yeah, some interesting yeah, kind of discussion. And uh, we want the webcast so it's, to, it's to a, grab it. Totally a great point. So thank you for sharing. In the IoT world, you're bringing up data from sensors, and you've got collectors coming up. And one of the things that you may be running is something that is monitoring the, the sensor health information, and you want to generate an alarm state. Well, those alarms are stateful. When I send it out to whatever system is, is coming out to warn somebody that something's bad, I have to know that they've received it. I have to, if they don't receive it, I have to resend it to them. At some point, they have an acknowledgement coming in. So there's a fair amount of stateful information that is coming up from collectors in the IoT space because of the amount of data that may be floating up into these collectors and alarm managers. I do need to have more than one of these guys run it here. Yeah. Great, great Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else have any examples? They... No? We'll get back to it. Uh, the questions, if anybody else has any ideas, you know, again, this is a forum, so. Um, our example is going to be Mongo. So this is actually how Mike and I met. We did some, some work with the Mongo image here at Red Hat to make it a little bit more uh, capable in terms of sharding and, and scaling with, uh, with OpenShift. So just a quick debrief. Um, you, of course, don't need to be a Mongo expert to attend this. So um, this is just the high level of what we'll see. Um, so we have clients, and then we have a, a Mongo S component. And this is the, the shard server of, of Mongo. If you think about the shards here, um, you can think of them as, as buckets, where data comes in, and then it's hashed, and it's determined which shard uh, that data should fall in. And then there can some config servers over on the right. This is where this uh, sort of partitioning information is kept. And then we have shards, and these will be exposed as, as staple sets. So we can add more secondaries as needed um, without maintenance overhead. So from that, we'll do a bit of a live demo here. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so be is the screen cut off. New resolution. Resolution's bad. Stand by. Displays. Yeah, that's why. All 
All right, so, so before this talk, I already set up a basic cluster. Uh, what we have, as I mentioned, is a, is a shard server. Wait, before go you go, can everybody in the back see that? Is it uh, quite visible? Or So they need to do a little bit of zooming in for so. Will you give me a thumbs up? I see a thumbs up. Thanks. Optimal. Suboptimal. Suboptimal. Does that mean zoom or not zoom? Yeah, yeah. Zoom, zoom one zoom. more. Okay. Zoom one more. Great. Good? All right. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we have a we have a shard server here. This is a this is nothing special. This is a this is deployed through a plain Jane deployment. It's a stateless component. And then we have config server, which is also exposed. It's basically just a, a wrapped replica set. This is exposed as a staple set. And then we have one shard. So this isn't currently very useful, but we'll go through some of the features and um, see how they may interact. The neat, the neat thing here is to show off network, one of the things we can do here is we can actually kill the primary, have a little bit of fun and see a re-election happen. So let's go, um, currently the way it works is when the, um, the storage is uninitialized, index zero actually starts up as primary. Maybe so. Zoom that as well. Shit, <laughs> okay. Good, not good. Good. Um, so we'll RLSH into the index one secondary. So let's do an OC get pods. Um, then let's get into ABC one. Um, actually, we don't even need to do this. We can just do OC logs. So how about we do OC logs pod and then tail the logs here. We should see some re-election activity happen once we kill the primary. So just to confirm that index zero is actually primary, let's, OS, let's RSH into that. I want to make that bigger as well. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for nothing, Tmux. All right. Excuse me, it is not the right thing. So Jeff is on the primary of the entire MongoDB replica set. So. Well, so actually it looks like um, index three is primary. So that's the one that we're gonna kill off. And then we're gonna look at index one and we're gonna see some traffic here. It correlates with re-election. So let's go ahead and kill that pod. Do you want to do a OC get pods and dash wait and kind of see sure. as uh, the replica set re or the Kubernetes replica set or stable set <coughs> reinstantiates itself? So just dash w. Ooh, that was fast. That's still terminating. So as you can see, it goes in an orderly manner, and it's not all at once. And you can tell what what uh, order it's in by the ending appended to the name of the or the namespace. So, so we're just seeing the entire. Otherwise, it would be a in a typical Kubernetes replica set. It'd just be a random. Uh, unique ID, so. So it looks like there was some activity here. Um, let's go back in, let's see if re-election happened. So three is primary. Oh well, well, we tried, folks. How about a ping? Can't go wrong with a ping. There you go. 
so you so we can we can establish connectivity from another replication or another replica there um, the other thing is that when staple sets scale up storage also scales up so we have we have corresponding storage here um, so this is not very useful so let's add another Saturn another replica set and then we'll watch some of these other features like or startup So you could talk a little bit about So some of this the um, so. Yeah, so this is a I know some of um this might be new to some people. This is OpenShift specific. This is a, a template. You can think of it a little bit like Helm. We're, um, we're gathering some parameters, and then we're going to use that to drive the creation of various resources. So we can look at this template afterwards to see what, what's being created here, if you'd like. And then um, also the, the new replica set needs to have, or oh, can you explain the replica set seed as well? So. Yeah, since we are using a template, um, we need the resources to be unique from the template, so we have this seed that's appended to the, the resource name, and that just allows for a unique resource uh, to be generated each run. It is generated, but I'm going to use DEF, because that's what I remember. So we're creating a new... It's going to one, it's going to four. Interesting way to see this is from the staple set view. The light blue is not ready. The gray is the, the pot is starting up, or the container is creating. So we're going to two, and then we can also see the storage being created alongside of this. So currently we have zero through two being created. And then we have three. And then eventually, that should be it. So there's that. So Mike's going to talk a little bit about uh, what we just saw at more of a high level graph view. So essentially, what we did is we uh, took advantage of what it, staple sets. It does, and that's from a Kubernetes perspective. Uh, we just defined that we were going to deploy a staple set and how many how many pods of the image that we were going to deploy, and that's listed in the blue or blue box. And so those got uh, instantiated uh, with unique unique orderly numbers. So based on the namespace, and then in addition to that, we created a headless service. So we don't need DNS. Uh, to be uh, taken care of uh, by, or clustered, a clustered IP, virtual clustered IP address to be taken care of by Kubernetes. We are doing it from the application level, so we just go ahead and we, we ping that service, and then it'll list all the members with inside of our staple set. So, right, so in this case, we don't need it to be load balance. We're going to use just that headless service as a base entry. So it's kind of color-coded. Like, this might be an interesting graph to, to look at later. So blue... The blue part comes from the headless service, and then the orange piece is generated from the staple set, its name definition. And then three is the ordinal index from, from Kubernetes. And then also, with regard to storage, it gets provisioned before the pod itself, so it needs to be available. It needs to be available before it, it's bound. And then when you remove members, uh, the storage still exists. So storage is treated as a first-class citizen with inside of Kubernetes. So. And just to show what we already have seen, um, as, as things come up, you know, the replicas can communicate with one another. They all have addressable space. So let's, we can talk a little bit about that. So it's zero to N. So one of the, uh, the guarantees we have is that um, if a pod comes up, uh, N plus one uh, isn't has a guarantee that uh, pod N has been started and is ready. Um, so 
this is basically lets us treat, potentially treat lower indices, indices as you know, masters or various other uh, applicable things. So given that, what are some interesting use cases that customers are using staple sets for, like uh, from, your, from your experience? So. Yeah, so we see, we see Confluence, we see Jira, um, we, see, we see databases, um, any of that uh, sort of master-slave relationship that, that tends to be, to be highlighted. Um, and now just some, some other things that aren't, that, aren't, that aren't represented in OpenShift, but uh, I think it's really cool in Kubernetes, is we have this idea of an update strategy. So currently, uh, the update strategy is default to undelete. So if you delete a stable set, pods are retained. Um, but with, I believe, 1.7, which isn't rolled in uh, yet with uh, the OpenShift that I'm showing, they have a, a rolling update concept. So you can actually have the, the pods shut down in the opposite direction. So N to 1 uh, will shut down in a, in a readiness fashion. In addition, you have partitions. So in the instance where you know, index 0 is, say, for uh, web logic, you have an admin server or something. You could have that associated with index 0 and then par partition off 1 to N to be applicable to your, to your update so that you don't touch your admin server, but when you roll out, you have 1 to N um, update. And then pod management. Um, so this is, this really allows you to forego the, the readiness entirely, in my opinion. So um, currently, it's, it's you know, ordered and ready. So we have the, that 1 to N relationship of, um, you know, waiting for the readiness probe to succeed. But if you just want to use staple sets, say, for storage provisioning capacity, then, you know, you can utilize parallel to just forego that entirely. So those are some of the cool things that we see. Um, and I'm really excited to see how it, how it develops in the future. So we, we got a question. So I'll let you go ahead and uh, repeat it for guys online. Is there any like capability to have like kind of individual instance of a, a stateful set, like addressing an individual instance and saying like, I want to stop this particular instance? I want to stop this particular or like, instance. I want to bounce this particular instance. Like when you're running like crap le legacy software inside something, at some point you're, someone's like, I just need you to bounce this thing and this one node is having a problem. We, had, like, we played around with this with like labels and affinity and it would just like, you know, you could trick it into doing that, but like having a way to say like, you know what, index zero, just stop it and let it restart. Yeah. So maybe go to the OpenShift console and then click on the, the representing staple set uh, pod on the right hand side. So you yeah, sure. I think you can just kind of delete yeah, bouncing would just be deleting, right? So, yeah, and then Kubernetes um, would take over and reinstantiate, and then the logic that's built into uh, the instantiation of that of that member will determine if it's either a primary. This is yeah specific to, to Mongo, so, but in general. That's just well, that's, you, you could do it with a, a Coop CTL and then kill the the. The pod, yeah, just yeah. delete the pod. <laughs> yeah. No worries. It's still it's still like a, a replication controller in that it's guaranteeing that a certain number of replicas is up. So uh, there's just that additional layer of making sure uh, ordering is is still preserved if you have that set. Is there a way to do that and then have it not start back up for a period of time? Um, that would be that would be a scale down. So if you have like special snowflakes within your stateful set, then uh, if you're so inclined, then you put those in lower indices. And then if, yeah. Here we go. Go ahead. Oh yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. One second, my partner is going to come to you. So when you delete this uh, pod in this case, the underlying PV gets removed, or it will be reattached to the new pod that will be reinstantiated. It actually gets preserved, so, so it's, preserved it's sticky. It's sticky to the index, mm -hmm. 
And that's, that's a really important sort of CYI, CYA sort of thing. Um, Delete any of the pods or the stable sets. Underlying provisioning of storage is, 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 is kept. So you know, if you have a, a database or something distributed like that, then um, life is still good. All the way in the back. Uh, could you tell me what the problems might be if you tried to deploy a, uh, a stateful application, like MongoDB or DB2, but not using stateful set? which is something we're doing right now. We have MQ series, DB2. We use deployment, um, which I, I assume is for, and again, I'm someone new to Kubernetes, which is stateless, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be working fine, but I heard, you know, for stateful applications, you better use stateful objects. So I can answer that. Uh, essentially, you get a lot of refactoring of the stateful application or stateful workload that you're working with in order to to suit uh, Kubernetes replica sets. So this was driven by demand from the community to be able to basically provide you an easier migration path to take advantage of microservices architecture associated with one, one of uh, a stateful application. So basically this gets you to get onto Kubernetes to begin with and then just have a more phased or methodical approach to decoupling those tightly integrated services. So. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, and like when um when Mike and I were originally working on this, uh, you know, one of the biggest things was provisioning of storage. So previously, we had customers where, no kidding, it would be weeks to months of wait time on storage team or for storage, or even really for uh, you know another team for for compute to add a new replica set. With this, you know. Deploying those types of applications and having a click and then having a new replica set is huge. That's really exciting. And also, because it's using Kubernetes, you also get a cloud native application, like from, from just putting a stateful application inside of Kubernetes to begin with. So now you can take advantage of provisioning across those cloud providers as well. So, so we got another. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I would just add to that that you know there's a number of um, applications that don't change their, their DNS name well. You know they'll go through and create new UUIDs or show up as new cluster members. Or uh, if you're going through and trying to configure and say, hey, you know we want these nodes to come up and find each other. You know the dynamic DNS portion that comes up with running a deployment, we're going to get you know that last five you know digits that are different in, in pods um, can be different. Whereas in stateful set, you're always guaranteeing it's going to have the same name. You can put that in a static config map or something else to make sure that you know you're always finding the same same box. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a question. Could you uh, talk a bit about um, network configuration, particularly for chatty services like Zookeeper or Red CD that need to know each other? Uh, how the network configuration is managed on a stateful set? Um, well, you can uh, you can dive into details, but if you want to just get going, going and running, it's really just a matter of creating that headless service. And that headless service is used to, to create those DNS entries per replica. And that's done automatically. So there's really no um, getting your hands into the details as far as that's concerned. But if you're talking about, um, you know, more of a managing how the pods are scheduled so that they, there's like low lat latency links, then that's not really a detail that you work with specifically with stateful sets. That's more something that you consider with labels and your scheduling policies. So, but it's definitely something to consider. Right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Jinx, you owe me a soda, Jeff, later. A soda? Yeah, go ahead. What types of volumes are we using? Is the For question. this, this is a host volume. So um, this is Minishift, essentially the analogous to Minikube on my, my machine. But there's okay. a lot of initiatives being driven around cloud native storage, uh, in, in particular from the Red Hat end. And we also have supported products as well. Uh, We've done this on EBS volume, so. so um, but basically. That works, that works just like you usually would, you know, creating the PVC. Those PVCs are just 
dynamically generated from a, a, a volume claim template that's defined in the staple set. Is the instance uh, deleted and then started on rolling updates if they're going to keep all their unique identifiers? Um, deleted and updated, yes. Deleted and then replaced. Yeah. Well, there's also a, a history associated with deployments, so it gets saved if you go to the. So it would be like scale down. So if you have like one to replica three, then three would get fully shut down, deleted, two would get fully shut down and deleted, one would get fully shut down and deleted, zero, et cetera. And then it would get recreated from the bottom top again, to top again, zero, one, two, three. Does that make sense? And all those network identifiers are sticky, so as they come back up, the rebound to that same address. Any other questions? And by the way, this, um, this demo can be done from this URL, uh, all the instructions I have here. So um, if you want to play around with it on your own. And of course, these, are, these slides are posted as well. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks we a lot. Appreciate it. Happy to talk.